Too excited. These slides are from 2014. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is do my very best. You don't want me to walk around, do you? Uh, I will try to stand still. I'm going to do my very best to uh, remember and recall all of the things that have been added to my slides in the last year and change because the Raspberry Pi changes a lot and uh, the Pi 2 didn't even exist when this slide deck got made. I'm really sorry. So I'm sure as you heard me say, I was just sitting outside, looked at my slides, closed my laptop, walked in and my laptop will not even turn on. No idea what's going on, so I'm very sorry. Uh, my name is Ruth Seeley, and as you can see, sometimes I do this presentation with Tom Calloway. You may have seen that happen before. Invisible Tom is standing right here. Just pretend he's telling you all sorts of good things about kernels. Uh, no, Tom works on our education outreach program, and so he is elsewhere right now. We both work for Red Hat, but what we would do with the Raspberry Pi is pretty much entirely irrelevant to the fact that we work at Red Hat. Uh, we had been using it as a way to have something fun in Fedora booths at events. And uh, then, as a result of that, ended up writing what I call a 400-page talk outline uh, all about the Raspberry Pi and fun things you can do with it. So what I'd like to, to ask you all is, how many of you have a Raspberry Pi? Yeah, at this point in the future, it's pretty much everybody who shows up to a Pi Talk. Now, how many of you have made something with it that is not XBMC or Cody? <laughs> Still a pretty good number. Who thinks you've made the coolest thing in the room? Oh, she's going for it. What do you have? Oh, that is super cool. I like that. We should talk. I need socks. Who else thinks they have the second coolest thing? GPS or GIS tablet. Yeah? I was making a Wi-Fi garage door opener so I don't have to take my remote out when I go for a ride. Oh. I moved it to an ESP. Nice. And you? Uh, we made a thing that read the UV off the sun and it had like a recorded speech and stitched it together. And um, one of the things makes it be last year. OK, so I'm just going to come sit down, and you guys can come give the talk. <laughs> cool? No, so uh, clearly, several of you have built very cool things, and the rest of you showed up to figure out what to do with the pie that's been sitting in your door for the last two years. And that is awesome. So let's talk about where this thing came from. Can you repeat GIS? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, not at this point, but we'll talk more <laughs> later. Uh, GIS tablet, knitting machine, UV thing, they were all great ideas video. I apologize for not saying them loudly. A garage door, which I will even say in not American. And I apologize for whatever Americanness leaks into this, and I will attempt to translate if necessary. So the Raspberry Pi was the idea of this guy named Evan Upton. And in 2008, he was a chip architect at Broadcom and saw what was this chip that they had developed for a purpose but weren't using. And he also was working at uh, Cambridge University and noticed that the students who are coming to college now are not the same sort of computer science students who were arriving in, say, the 90s. Because those students had arrived at college having to build their computer and write some code for it in order to make anything happen on it, and they actually knew what was going on. Whereas now, students show up at college, decide to be computer science majors, and they think that opening Firefox makes them experts in their computers. It doesn't? It does not, but you are at the right place to change that. So he had this idea of creating some sort of small, inexpensive device that he could get into the hands of students, specifically in the UK, so that they would show up at college having half a clue. And the reason it's called the Pi is because his idea was that it would be useful to teach them Python. So you got some hardware, you figure that part out, you learn some Python, you show up at college, great. So uh, they started manufacturing in early 2012, and they made 10,000 boards, because he thought that was all they were ever going to sell. Has anyone tried to buy a Pi Zero? <laughs> How's that going for you? Yeah, does anybody have one? Yeah, yeah, so one guy here has one, and I've been telling uh, everybody I know that Australians are the nicest people on the planet because this person I did not know stopped me yesterday and said, are you Ruth? Do you have a Pi Zero yet? Would you like to borrow mine, stranger? And I said yes, and it's in my bag, and, and we'll show it around uh, because that slide is not in here. Uh, so this is... Uh, all discombobulated of how I normally tell this story at this point, but this is also related to where the pie came from. And you guys are much more likely to know what this is than anyone in the US. BBC, BBC Micro. This was the inspiration for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and for once, I don't have to explain to you what this is. When this launched in 1981, it had a 2 megahertz processor, and you had a choice of 16K of RAM or 32K, and they were called the Model A and the Model B, just like the Pi. And just like the Pi, it was designed for educational uses. That's why the Pi things are, are named what they are. So that's your fun trivia for the day. 
So here's an old pie. <laughs> this is the Model B, which I'm guessing is what most of you have, since you uh, seem to have bought pies a long time ago, stuck them in a drawer, and forgotten to do anything with them since then. It's uh, that Broadcom chip is the one little bit that keeps it from being entirely open hardware and makes me bananas. But uh, you know, we've got the, a great GPU, and we've got 512 megs of RAM now, and people think this is an awesome computer. This is a really great computer from 1997. However, it is tiny. Now, the Pi Zero is uh, functionally similar, except you have a lot less USB, you have fewer display options, and uh, no Ethernet. And so realistically, so here, this is going to make you feel better about your lack of Pi Zero in your life, unless you really need it to be that tiny. By the time you buy all the stuff that you need in order to turn a Pi Zero into a Raspberry Pi, you might as well have just bought the Raspberry Pi to begin with. So there you go. You can feel better about your lack of Pi Zero. It's still tiny and cute, and I know you want one because theoretically it's only $5, but shipping. <laughs> How much did you spend for your pie to get it here? Uh, 14, um, but they sold it out. Maybe yeah, 14 to get your $5 pie. Also, uh, they are intermittently available on the Pie Hut today. If you have wonderful luck and don't want to play the lottery, you can attempt to get a Pi Zero on the Pie Hut today. They've released more of them. So for the most part, the, the examples that I'm going to give you, the tips and tricks and the projects were built with Model Bs. Uh, I have met like two people ever in the last few years who actually bought Model As, and only one of whom had an actual purpose for it. It's $10 cheaper, it's less powerful, but for $10 for most of the people who are showing up here, you might as well just buy a Model B. Of course, now there's the Pi 2. And it makes some important differences, particularly with the GPIO. And this is one of the places where it's going to be really sad that we don't have the current slides, because uh, I can show you what all of the different GPIO do. Sadly, all of that is not so well embedded in my head that I can do it without showing you the slides. But the biggest important difference is that while the Pi 2 has 40 pins, GPIO pins, the uh, old B and the B plus have 26. But those 26 are still in the same place with the extra up to 40 added. So whatever instructions you're reading that, that use the GPIO, you can keep rolling with them even if you have a Pi 2 and not worry about it. So for all of you who have your Pi in a drawer and you have no idea what's in there, there is a magical solution to this, this uh, problem. You can just run a cat proxy PO info and you get all this information. And towards the bottom is a revision number. And this example is 000E. And that you can look up, uh, there's a site called elinux.org. And if you have ever Googled anything with the words Raspberry Pi, sooner or later you're going to end up on elinux.org, which is a treasure trove of knowledge, particularly about what in the world has gone wrong and why your Pi is not working. The answer is usually because you bought a $35 computer. <laughs> When things go wrong with the Raspberry Pi, or, or particularly when you go, why doesn't it do this? Or why doesn't it have this? It's because it was not designed to make you build cool robots. It was designed to be an inexpensive device to get children to learn something. That's why it doesn't have the cool thing that you want in your robot. So uh, to get back to this, the revision number will tell you what you have. And if it's 2 through 6, it's the Model B that had 256 megs of RAM. 7 through 9 is the old Model A. Then it goes to D through F. And then it gets really weird when we get into the Pi 2 and the compute module and the 0. And they skip from like 11 to 13 back to 12. And then the Pi 0 is like 90056 or something. There's no sequential order. But that can help you figure out what you have, which is good to know uh, for an assortment of reasons. Uh, particularly uh, when there are things that were troublesome on some of the older Pies, and you can find ways to overcome those problems. Significantly, which is not a part of this, uh, if you are having weird power problems that you can't solve any other way, weird USB problems, or just weirdness, which is pretty normal with the Pi, uh, look at your Pi and see if the RAM chip says Hynix, H-Y-N-I-X. There was a run of them. They don't all have the same RAM. There were three manufacturers of the RAM over the course of Pi manufacturing. The Pi 2, or the, the Pi 2s, I think, are all using Micron RAM. There were some of the Bs and B pluses that had Hynix RAM, which is known to cause you all sorts of trouble in your life. And often, I believe the best solution to that is simply buying a new Pi. But um, if it won't boot, you can solve that by using a more current distro. Uh, but other problems, you just. I, I, some people have just gone, you know what, it's not worth my life. I'll buy another $35 pie. Uh, I'm going to skip buying parts because you guys don't live in the US and none of that information is as relevant. And I'm sure that given the number of hands, you all know where to buy your parts. So let's get started actually with the pie. Uh, the first thing that you need is an SD card. Now, that's your hard drive, of course. Most quality cards are OK. If you actually recognize the brand name on there, 
probably awesome. But getting a good SD card is important to this process, not only because many of your problems can be solved by not having a crappy SD card, but the, the, the SD card is a little bit of what, especially for educational purposes, makes the Pi awesome. Because if you can do whatever stupid nonsense you want to Linux, and then it goes all wrong, and you stick a new SD card in, your life is better again. It's great, especially for education, because you can just tell your kid, I don't care what you do. Like, type whatever you want on the command line. If something blows up, we just, we'll start over. It's OK. Uh, there used to be a bug with class 10 cards, which has largely been resolved. But again, elinux.org, the magical land, has a list of like every SD card possibly ever by brand and class and reports on whether or not something works. So if you want to double check because you don't have a drawer full of 80 billion SD cards because they fit in all of your cameras and all of your things, you can check that. Uh, they used to tell you not to use micro SD cards and an adapter, except then at the same time that they were saying that that was a bad idea, that was all that Adafruit was shipping with their kits. And so I never figured out why that was a bad idea. It's never not worked for me. But uh, again, with the Pi, the Pi is a, a finicky little creature. It has strange ideas about what's OK and what's not. And what works perfectly fine for me is going to be a disaster for you. So. Google is your friend. Try something else. Be patient with your weird little $35 computer. Uh, in other news that is far better now in slides not from 2014, uh, HDMI has been across all of the pies. But what we have now that we did not have before is that for several years, there was this little connector called the DSi connector right over by the Raspberry Pi logo that did nothing, nothing at all. And then last September, they finally gave us the display. Uh, it's a display specifically meant for the Pi that uses that DSi connector, which is pretty awesome. I think it's uh, only about 800 by 600. It's at 60 frames per second. It's a pretty cool little, uh, little display, and it has mounting holes for the Pi on it. And so if that meets your needs, it is specifically made for the Pi, and it sells for about $60. But uh, I like fun alternative display options. <laughs> this is one of them. This is an old style of Kindle. And if, even if you don't think that that is a fun project, something that you want to do, it's amusing to go read his instructions about how you might do this. Because he insults you the whole time. And I, I find it amusing. He says things like, if you don't know what a terminal is, I'm not sure why you're reading this article in the first place. And then he tells you that you should have two of these ancient Kindles because you're going to destroy one along the way. Uh, the Atrix lap dock is an old Motorola device that was for, it was, it was a $400 accessory for an $800 phone or something when it came out, and then it was obsolete after eight months or something. But now you can buy them for like 40 bucks on eBay. And what the lap dock is, is a teeny tiny keyboard with a teeny tiny screen and an HDMI port and power. So what I'm saying is, it's a teeny tiny laptop for your Raspberry Pi. It's a really fun alternative. Uh, this is the part where generally Tom would tell you things about touch screens, but the aforementioned uh, DSi port specifically made for the Raspberry Pi monitor is a touch screen. So that is by far now the simplest way to go, and most of that information is no longer uh, accurate, nor is any of this. <laughs> we're just gonna we're just gonna start sliding through slides and talk about a lot of cool projects. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. Uh, Tom and I have often recommended Pydora. Pydora is not exactly what you would call a lively project right now, but there is some success already happening with simply running Fedora on the Pi 2, and so we hope to have better instructions for that in the very near future. Nevertheless, even when we were telling everyone Pydora is great, we also would tell you that the right distro is the right distro for your project. And so the easiest example of this is that if you want to set up a media center, you should use RasBMC, which is now called Kodi. The, the project has changed because it's RasBM based, but it's the whole thing in one package, and you flash your SD card, and you're done. You don't have to do anything else. You should pick the, the distro that's right for you. I mention Occidentalis because if you go read, it's the Adafruit distribution. And if you go read the page about it, they describe it as a learning distribution. Learning distribution implies to me that that would be a really great thing to give my children. Except what they mean by learning distribution is you're a hardcore hardware hacker who already knows things and can deal with it. So I, I believe they're a bit misleading. Nevertheless, if none of these options sound good to you, this is a teeny tiny fraction of the number of distros that people have optimized specifically for the Pi. There is something out there that you want to use. Uh, Noobs is, I think, the easiest and best choice. And it stands for new out-of-box software. If you buy a ready-to-go SD card from one of the vendors, it's probably going to come with noobs on it. And what makes noobs awesome is, like I was saying, how the, the Pi is great for people who want to screw things up. 
noobs is definitely meant for people who want to screw things up. Because the way this works is you pick the, the distro that you want at boot, it sets it all up for you, and then you do something terrible. Or you think, I'm not really a fan of Arch, I'm going to try RasBMC now. You hold down Shift at boot, it gives you a do-over. That's all it takes. Perfect for people who want to try different things. It used to be that all of this uh, was put on your SD card to begin with. Now, if you want something besides Raspbian, you have to have a network connection to get the others, which is a little kind of eh, but trying to save space. Does anyone think this sounds like a good idea? You are wrong, sir. <laughs> you also are wrong. <laughs> have you done this? Yes. Yeah? How's it going for you? So you had, I'm sorry, you had graphics drivers problems? Ah, so there is a, a community of sorts around doing this. And I, was, I spent about a week really determined to make this happen, even though I knew it was not exactly what the pie was meant to do. But that's, I describe our book as 400 pages of bad ideas you should do anyway. Every so often, there's a, there's a little warning box that says, you might make magic smoke, but you should try this. Yeah, it, it is a terrible idea. So I want, you can successfully get Android on your Pi. And then here's what happens. You move your mouse, and then you stand back, and then eventually your cursor goes. It's very exciting. And so then I flash that card with something else. <laughs> so now you need to get stuff onto your SD card. Uh, you are almost all probably competent Linux users who know how to get your images onto your cards. If you don't, I like the handy dandy Fedora ARM installer where I just pointed the image and pointed my SD card and magical things happen and I don't need DD or anything. If you are on a Mac, there is an RPI SD card builder that does it. If you are on Windows, you might be at the wrong room. If you don't want to do any of those things, as I mentioned, there are preloaded cards. You can just buy yourself a card. You don't have to worry about the card being the right type. You don't have to worry about the distro getting on there. It just comes with your Pi, and magical things happen, which is particularly good. A lot of people ask me, like, what, what things should I buy if I want to give a Pi to a kid? And that's a really easy way. Just add it all to your cart, send it off. So whatever problems you are having with your Pi, the first thing that you should check is the power source, uh, which you would think could have solved my laptop problems, but apparently not. Five volts. The Pi wants five volts. The Pi 2 is slightly more tolerant of, of this, but those Bs and B pluses that you have in your drawers, they want five volts with a quarter volt of tolerance at most, and they want clean one amp. Uh, I say it's why you shouldn't use iPhones, because if you use an Android phone, you already have 47 cables that will power your Raspberry Pi perfectly fine. Now, if you got those cables and the bit that goes into the outlet from a free vendor swag booth at some conference somewhere, it may be a really terrible cable, and that could be your problem, and you should try a nice cable. But at least you have 47 cables you can try. If you have mobile projects, if, like if you want to build that, that cliche robot that I mentioned, or uh, I have a, sadly not pictured here because I think it was after this slide deck, uh, who remembers Transformers in the 80s? I built a Soundwave costume that has a Pi in the helmet and a Pi powering a video screen in the chest. And so since I didn't want to be plugged into a wall because that's not really that fun, it's hard to dance when you're plugged into a wall. I used power bricks, the little power bricks that you're walking around the conference with to recharge your phone. At first, I wasn't sure how well this was going to work. Obviously, like more milliamp hours is going to get you more, more time. But I plugged my Pi into a kind of sad small one. I don't remember exactly how big it was. Forgot about it. 16 hours later, it was still on. And I was like, oh, all right, this is going to work. They're pretty awesome. And you can get super cheap ones on DX.com, which I had not thought about until yesterday. And someone mentioned it. And I realized, you guys get stuff from DX about 1,000 times faster than I do. Because for us, DX.com is where you buy stuff super cheap, and then two months later, you get to build your project. Now, if you, uh, if you have a Raspberry Pi, and you've noticed that right behind the, where you put the power cord in, there's a cute little silver cylinder. That's not a thumb holder. Uh, a lot of people have broken that right off, thinking that's a good place to hold their Pi. So when you do that, and you need to replace that little capacitor, these are the words that you should Google. Also, you must solder it back on in the right direction with the black stripe facing outwards. It's, it's not your Pi almost certainly will run without it. You might have power problems. It might not work at all. So just don't hold the little capacitor. It doesn't like that. Now, what is, what is an obvious feature of electronics that your Pi does not have? Yes. 
He said on off. There is no power switch on your Raspberry Pi. So how might you add one? There is a magical set of pins just for this purpose. It's near the uh, HDMI port, and you just stick two little header pins in there, short them out, or add an actual switch. But it's more fun to short out your pins. And poof, you have a, a, a power switch on your Pi. Now, as I mentioned, your Pi likes super clean power. And so if you're not sure if you're getting super clean power, you can test that. And this shows you the, the touch points. They're labeled TP1, which is the 5 volt, and TP2, which is the ground. And so if you set your multimeter range to 20 volts and uh, touch the red lead to TP1 and the black lead to TP2, you want to be seeing really at least 4.8. And if you're not seeing that, we're going to check on your polyfuse on the back side. Now, the original Pies had a bunch of polyfuses. And if you're not familiar, polyfuses are self-healing fuses, except sometimes they don't self-heal. Uh, or eventually you have abused them so much that they no longer are interested in self-healing. The newer Pies are down to one. And uh, so those testing points are on the back side. Uh, so you're going to test the back side of TP2 and the part of F3 that's facing the SD card. For the original test, the, the one on the front side, you want to plug in all your peripherals, because then you're going to know how much your assorted bits are sucking out. For this, you want to unplug everything, one lead to TP2 and one lead to F3, and that'll tell you the voltage coming out of the polyfuse and whether it is blown. Uh, and, and many of your Pi problems can be solved by checking the power. If you are running things off of the USB ports, now this is another problem that the Pi 2 has made significant progress on solving. But if you are trying to plug every USB device you have ever had into those USB ports, you need a powered hub. Because there are, there are two types of USB devices, and the low-powered ones nobody has. <laughs> they practically don't exist. So all those things you're trying to cram in there are sucking the power out of your Pi, and it is sad, and it is crying. And so when you press the S key, and then 10 seconds later, 47 S's go across the screen, that is your problem. Now, your Pi has other uh, in important information on it for you. And this is another piece of information that I would recommend going to eLinux to get exactly what it means. Because depending on your Pi version, which is why I told you how to find that, the LEDs tell you different things. And this is one example of uh, this is what the Pi, this is what the B was telling you. I think this is even pre B plus. But you can look up and find out exactly what yours are telling you. And uh, so that's why if you decide to build a case, it's handy to have a window into your LED so that you can see what's happening. Your uh, boot partition used to require four files. I believe it only requires two files now. This is when it's super handy to have my notes on my actual slides. Uh, again, elinux.org. I, I apologize again. I am doing my best to suck all of the information out of the back of my head for you on, on what's changed in the last year and a half. Now, as I mentioned, GPIO is part of what makes your Pi super cool, because that's how you're going to build your super awesome projects. GPIO are those little pins that make it hurt worse than Legos to step, step on your Pi, which I say from experience. They will leave marks in your foot. It's not cool. GPIO stands for general purpose in out. It's called general because you can control its behavior in or out uh, with the software. Now, if you came to Pi hacking from Arduino, as many people did, these are 3 volt, not 5 volt like Arduino. Did I mention the magic smoke? You will release the magic smoke. It's a one-time trick. And there's no overvoltage protection. So you should use an external board instead of soldering directly on the Pi and then work it all out later. This is one of my favorite projects ever. It's called the Raspberry Leap. And you can buy little hardware versions of it now. This is an old paper one that you could print out. If you, like me and many other nerds of our kind, are super blind, this will help you figure out exactly which pin you're trying to plug something into. <laughs> Um, yeah, let's just talk about cool projects now. So first thing you need is a case. Uh, you have lots of options of how to make a case. You can make a case out of all sorts of things. You can 3D print one. And actually, some of the best cases we've had were the ones that we 3D printed. We bought some uh, from Adafruit that would, uh, if you remember, if you have the bees that have the little plastic holders for the SD cards, they're, they're metal now on the micro SD cards. But the old SD card holders were plastic, and the case would break those off when you pulled the SD card out. That is a poor feature. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy many, many cases. Or uh, I was talking about cases one day, and someone held his up, and he goes, this is my case. And it was the cardboard box that it comes in, and he had taken an X-Acto knife and cut out holes for all the parts. Perfectly functional. I, however, am a fan of stealing my children's Legos. and building all sorts of cases, which means you can make them look like whatever you want to look like. <laughs> uh, 
This one uh, was made by a guy named Brian Gillespie. He calls it the Raspberry Pi Command Center and says it's fully OSHA ISO 9001, ASME IEEE, and Sarbanes-Oxley compliant. <laughs> now, if you do like the LEGO plan, uh, you can simply buy this kit. Now, <laughs> I am also an editor for a website called Geek Mom. And a few years ago, my children kept wanting LEGO kits. And I was thinking, I feel like these are really expensive. And I had LEGOs. And I don't think my parents spent this much money on LEGOs. Something has to have changed, right? This guy's like, yeah, yeah, that stuff is expensive. And so uh, if you are interested in it later, I can either give you the diatribe or send you the link to I, what I did was I went and pulled out historical data on the cost of LEGOs price per brick in sets going back to the beginning of time. It turns out they're not actually more expensive now. It's just that the sets have 11 billion pieces in them. So uh, that said, this is a poor price per brick kit. <laughs> On the upside, it comes with a little raspberry that you get to stick on top. And so that's fun. So yeah, if you're the lazy Lego sort of person or don't have children from whom to steal them and don't want to encase it in a, what, how much does the Death Star cost here? It's like 400 US. Yeah. That's probably a bad way to encase your pie, but it would be really awesome. <laughs> a float? Did you say that it's going to float? Like a, like a corn cob well. Oh, we'll, we'll get to the floating part, I hope. I don't actually know what's in these slides, so we're kind of winging it here. <laughs> uh, what I'll do when I get to the end, if we have time, I can go out to the web and show you some more awesome projects that probably aren't in here. Uh, now, what, for a lot of people, I, I make this joke at the beginning about how many of you have done something that isn't Cody or XBMC. And that's, I, I made this joke for a long time. And then I saw Eben Upton deliver a keynote about the Raspberry Pi. And he said that at that time, 2 million pies had been sold, 1 million were in drawers, and a half a million were XBMC. And I felt really justified in my humor. It is, however, a really good starting point. And it's the first thing that I had my daughter do when she was about six or seven years old. And she did it completely independently. So if you have someone who's made a little nervous by this odd green thing that, like, my computer's supposed to be inside a plastic case, right? Like, I'm not supposed to see that. This is a good starting point for them. And uh, again, it's called Cody Now. It's an awesome project, little home theater PC, that big. Now, whether or not you can do it, I used to use this guy as the example, and now I have my six-year-old can do it. But this is a comment on the old XBMC website where he basically says, I didn't know what I was doing. I have no idea what's going on. But like 10 minutes later, it works. And that's pretty sweet. This is an example of somebody who used open source and went, it just works. It's a good day. Now, I, however, so when, when Tom and I decided to write this book, what we did was, was not the most organized way of going about it. We got on Adafruit and just ordered a whole bunch of parts and then started figuring out what to do with them and spread them all over the, the floor in Red Hat and <laughs> started playing. And I said, the first thing I wanted to do is I had two old Game Boys. And I'm like, Pi's about the size of a Game Boy. I could shove that in there. And so that was the first thing I started working on. And you can see for a few obvious reasons why this didn't work out, namely that that old connector shoving out the side was never, ever going to fit into a Game Boy case. But what this picture is awesome to demonstrate is that even though I keep saying the pie is kind of finicky and it's going to be annoyed with you and do stupid things, this is, picture is an example of why the pie is really, really tolerant of your stupidity. And so that is a little 2 and a half inch TFT screen that when I bought it from Adafruit had no documentation, no data sheet, no nothing. It was just like, here you go, have a screen. And I was really impatient, as you can see. And instead of connecting it in any sensible way, used itty bitty alligator clips and made sure nothing was touching. What makes this an illustration of the Pi's tolerance is that now there are data sheets available for this. And that screen requires 12 volts. <laughs> <laughs> But I played Tetris for a really long time that afternoon. So it requires in finger quotes. So I call it this the Pi Boy. Several people have actually successfully shoved a Pi into their old Game Boy cases now. If you decide to do this, this requires a tri-tip screwdriver. And that was how I learned that a tri-tip screwdriver was even a thing. And that none of the engineers in the Red Hat office had such a thing. It was very sad. Now, if you add a P to Pi Boy, you get the Pip Boy, which is another one of those things where somebody looks at the Pi and goes, that's about the size of my arm. If you don't know what this is, it's from a game called Fallout. And it uh, generally goes on your arm, something like this. And this was one, of, one such person who said, that could go on my arm. Now, I have itty bitty bird wrist. I don't think the pie's going on my arm successfully. But that dude, he made it work. Sadly, his pit boy died like two hours before the Halloween party he was going to wear it to. It's, it's a very tragic story. Uh, my invisible Tom here, on the other hand, I do this because Tom is six foot four. My invisible Tom here. 
The thing he wanted to do was play video games on his Pi. Now, if the, that is your dream, you want to play video games on your Pi, there are so many ways to accomplish this. There are emulators that easily will take you up to PlayStation 2 and a few things beyond that. But if you want to play your childhood video games, you are in luck. And uh, I am not going to give you links to where you would find such ROMs, but you are very smart people with the internets. If you would like to do this in a very tiny fashion, <laughs> cigarette lighter for scale. Now, as you can see, that is tiny. This requires cutting your pie in half <laughs> to shove it into the case. The, the other thing I love about this project, I always really appreciate as an open source contributor when people share how they've made their projects. It's awesome that you shared your project, that you told me you made something cool, but what if I want to make it now? Could you tell me how I could make it? These people have posted instructions. They look like this. <laughs> I don't care, because at least they shared, and that's awesome. Now, when we started talking about the games, I said, now with a pie and a trip to Ikea, I don't know what, I, I, there's got to be an actual name for these devices. I call it the Pizza Hut table, because it's the only place I ever saw them, was Pizza Huts have these, where the game switches back and forth between player one and player two. I believe they are technically coffee table games or something like that. And I was like, oh, Ikea and a pie, and we're there, right? I thought this was genius, and then I Googled it, and 47 people had done it, which is evidence that whatever you want to do, somebody has done it, and you can go use their instructions, and that's totally cool. Uh, I, I don't think I have a slide in here, but my, my other example of somebody has already done it is at Red Hat we have a mailing list for all of the offices. And so this guy sent a mail an, an email to the local mailing list one day and said, does anybody have a Geiger counter I could borrow for the weekend? <laughs> and I knew this guy, and so I messaged him on IRC, and I was like, hey, what you doing? And instead of telling me, he goes, great, can you build me one with a pie? And I was like, I don't think, yes, apparently you can. <laughs> yes. And uh, more interestingly, not only can you build a Geiger counter with a pie, but it was actually really important after the Fukushima disaster in Japan because the government was not releasing valid data about radiation. And so a big community project grew out of this to build Raspberry Pi Geiger counters and then aggregate that data. It was all released as open data, and, and it made a big difference. So let's talk about actual educational purposes, and then we'll go back to building weird things. This is one of my favorite books for teaching kids some programming concepts. Are you guys, is anyone not familiar with Scratch? OK, so Scratch is this fun kids program, and its mascot is that little cat that you see up there in the middle. And then this is your coding block. And it, they fit together like puzzle pieces, which helps you, like if that puzzle piece doesn't fit together, that's not where that chunk of code goes. This is a book called Super Scratch Programming Adventure. It's in its second edition. And what it does is the comic book on the left, the cat is in peril, something has happened. And then in the next couple of pages, you solve his problems with Scratch. What's great about this is at the end of the book, you've made your own video game. And that's so important for kids to have some sort of sense of success that they have accomplished something rather than uh, how many programming books do you have on your shelf where you're not accomplishing anything? It's just a bunch of code snippets. And you're like, oh, now I've got to do something on my own. All right. Uh, a slightly more advanced tool, Google Coder. Google Coder came out of Google Labs. You install it on your Pi, and then you access it from Chrome on your laptop or whatever. And this is what it shows you. And it teaches you HTML, CSS, Node.js, and JavaScript. And this is eyeball is the little pair of eyeballs that follow your mouse around. Gadgetoid is like the old asteroid game. And uh, the plus sign, you can start from scratch. What's really cool about this is it gives you these examples to start from. And so you can go into a very basic editor mode where you just change some variables. You're like, eh, maybe I want bigger rocks. Maybe I want fewer rocks in the asteroid game. And you can see how that affects it. And then you can go into the whole set of code and start changing things. Or you can start from scratch and, and build it on your own. There are uh, now. In the UK, there was a, a grant from Google and another organization whose name, I apologize, is escaping my mind. But they gave uh, pies to 35,000 kids in, in UK schools. And not only has that happened, but then in assorted places around the world, there are an increasing number of Raspberry Pi-based labs. Oh, I have five minutes left. We're going to have to talk faster. That's weird without slides, right? So this is a solar-powered lab in Ghana uh, from a group called Powering Potential. And they started with just uh, one school. Now they have at least one school in every one of the uh, equivalents of states or provinces. 
And they have actual data about how this is improving outcomes and how kids have gone on to computer science degrees out of this program. That's pretty amazing. All right, we're going to go super fast. Back to fun stuff. Pylorian guy. <laughs> Halloween costume ready to go. Let's see if the GIF works. There we go. So I don't, I don't have current slides, but I have videos that work, which is unusual. Home automation, totally awesome. <laughs> there are lots of home automation projects, but this is my favorite one because I'm a huge Star Trek nerd. If you are not a huge Star Trek nerd, that is the LCARS interface that you use on the next generation to, to access their computers. Now, if you did come to the Pi from Arduino land, you have a drawer full of Arduino shields and a Raspberry Pi, and you would like them to go together. There are devices for that purpose. This is called the Ala mode. And then you stick your Arduino shields on top of it, and you have Raspberry Pi Ala mode. More videos working? This is amazing. My videos never work, so at least there's something going on. This is a uh, voice-activated coffee ordering system. So you can tell your phone, uh, call my coffee machine, make me some coffee. Sadly, you still have to get up and go get the coffee, so I haven't decided whether this is an actual accomplishment yet, but I like the spirit of things. Uh, this is a, a little board I built to control our Christmas lights. Uh, the little four blue things in the middle, if you're not familiar, are simple little relays, and each one of them goes to an outlet. And so then we use Python scripts on the Pi to control them. So if you've ever seen those awesome displays, and uh, if you'd like to see one, I'll happily pull them up on YouTube, where it's the outside of somebody's house, and it makes all of these lights blink and plays the Star Wars theme or something. That's how you do that. There's another project called Pi FM. Uh, that you can use to turn your Pi into an FM transmitter, which is probably illegal where you live. And so take that for what you will. This is probably my favorite project. Uh, I call it the best Valentine ever for a good reason. So this is a uh, bilingual Japanese and English speaking, receiving, video playing, basically fully functional R2 unit that this guy built for his girlfriend for Valentine's Day. And then she married him. <laughs> Clearly a successful project. All right, who said, uh, oh, we were going to make it float? So if you want to make it sync, this is uh, vertical video, boo. Uh, we'll, we'll blame Invisible Tom. There is a Rust-Oleum product called NeverWet. And NeverWet is a two-part process that you spray on things to make them waterproof. And it explicitly says on the can, do not use this on electronics. So we used it on electronics. <laughs> and as you can see, it works perfectly fine. What I don't know is how long this would last. And uh, I also, among my many hobbies, uh, do mermaid things. And so I'm thinking about making some sort of electronic tail and seeing how long it takes me to shock myself. <laughs> this is actually the Geiger counter results. Oh, that was the Geiger counter results. These slides were in a wacky order. And this is, this is another one of my favorite projects. Uh, it is an excellent device to send up in the payload for near-Earth orbit photography because it weighs nothing and it has all of the things in there. And you can use the Pi camera, and then you are pretty much set. And so in the US, your payload for this has to be under six pounds. That's not a whole lot. And, and so this project actually uses a tiny styrofoam cooler, Raspberry Pi, Pi camera, and one more camera, and that's about your six pounds. And it's pretty sweet. I have ideas all day, but I am all out of time, so I'm just going to give you these links. And again, I profoundly apologize for whatever has happened to my laptop. Uh, but if you would like to talk more Pi things, I will be here the rest of the day, and I'm happy to tell you about all sorts of cool projects. So thanks for coming. Thank you. She says we have time for a couple of questions. Does anybody? Oh, hey, she has a question. For half an hour, we tried. Uh, we tried taking it out a couple of times, but I'll try leaving it out and see if it it works. Half an hour, I'm on it. I will do it because if I don't, you guys, I don't go home until February 19th. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna show. You, I, I hope I can find. I'm gonna show you the creepiest Raspberry Pi pro, uh, project ever. Does anybody else have questions while I'm looking for it? There he is. Okay. <laughs> So this guy really liked the movie Toy Story and discovered he still had one of these, ripped the guts out. Uh, but what's creepy about it is the voice that it has. Now, it, will, um, it reads him the movie listings. It, it broadcasts NPR to him. Oh, we didn't plug in the audio. Hey, AV guy, where's the audio cable? <laughs> there it is.
Captain America, The Winter Soldier, two, yep, The Lego okay. Movie, three. All right. Rio so, two, four. The so what it also five, does, right uh, it it alerts people when he's leaving the office. I think that's what this one is. Hey pal, I got some information for you. Pick up the receiver. Yeah, creepy phone is talking to you. Woody has escaped from Sunnyside. <laughs> Sunnyside is the the daycare in Toy Story, if you don't remember. Uh, what? Oh, um. Put radio dial six. Oh, hey, wow! I actually found it. I wasn't sure that was gonna work. So this is uh, another sort of case. This one is 3D printed, but it's 3D printed out of a flexible elastopolymer. And it has uh, LEDs in it. it has, I think they're NeoPixels that it has in it. And so he's made it so that he can do, uh, it also has an accelerometer, so he can track its movement and draw pictures of it. And this is possibly not the most brilliant thing that you can do with your electronics, but you can bounce it down the stairs. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, if you watch the rest of this video, he's pretty pleased with himself. Uh, the other one I like is the Star Wars light. So I wonder if, I don't even know what the video's name. Does anybody else have a favorite project you want to share with the class? You know what? We're just going to assume that whatever I find was made with a Raspberry Pi, because it could be. <laughs> Boom. This, this you can do with your Pi. Uh, also, the Pi FM project that I mentioned that is an illegal way to build your own little transmitter uh, is a good way to teach your children some, some semi-advanced math because it, it uses the clock speed and you have to do some division to figure out what you're broadcasting on. The Star Wars music is always a good way to end a show, right? Yeah. Good to go. Well, so that's why that's why um, that's why the FM transmitter. That's what um, a lot of people do is a very short-range transmitter, so that you can drive by and tune to that station, so that your neighbors don't hear this. Now, I have neighbors who do do this and do not use a transmitter and do use speakers, and they play Frozen on a screen for six weeks. It's not super loud, and I live far enough away, but I do think of their immediate neighbors when I drive by. <laughs> yes. Yes, it wants one amp, very adamantly. Um, so, what's that? Uh, he said amperage is also important. One amp, five volts, one amp. That is the key to happiness. <laughs> Sorry, here, I'll, I'll stop the Star Wars here. Thank you all for coming.